Um, thank you very much for attending this session today uh, in the midst of this amazing exhibition on uh, historical Kuala Lumpur. Um, uh, the painter Chia Yu Chen was uh, a living presence as we were growing up, uh, particularly in the 70s. Uh, and I, I recall many of his paintings being published in, at that time, one of the great uh, resources of information uh, on a yearly basis, which was the New Straits Times Annual, uh, now no longer in existence, actually no longer in existence for quite a while. Um, <clears throat> just a, a couple of uh, announcements and uh, clarifications and to contextualize our talk today. Um, the professor uh, is just recovering from a major um, heart bypass, uh, which he had, uh, uh, which, which uh, um, took place about six months ago. Uh, I think many of you actually know him here, uh, and this is perhaps the first time you're seeing him in, in all that time. And this is his first public session. Uh, so we are going to be quite casual. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to focus uh, on uh, many of, of the aspects of his historical writings, uh, in particular in the forging of national history. Uh, and we're also going to be quite intimate in the sense uh, we may talk about lots of people and invoke names that many of us uh, don't remember anymore but who were so crucial in the formative writings uh, of the history of Kuala Lumpur and the history of Malaysia. Uh, many of them were his colleagues, many of them were his contemporaries, and many of them were his mentors. And I hope in the course of our conversation and the invocation of these names, that of course we can fall back on many of the work, works and historical writings of, of these people, uh, whose books are still scattered around and highly sought after, but they are in circulation in second-hand bookstores. Uh, I don't trust our libraries, so I don't know if they exist in our libraries. Uh, but um, uh, they are a good, refreshing um, a recollection of, of uh, many of the personalities who were so uh, crucial uh, to the foundational writings of Malaysian history uh, post-independence. Uh, um, I would also like to um, clarify that we will be talking a great deal about your particular historical interests and how you evolved as a historian. Uh, and a lot, some of that will include your reflections on Kuala Lumpur. Um, just a, a further added, um, some added information from the introduction that was given. Um, uh, Professor Ku Ke Kim uh, was born in 1937 uh, in Kampa Pera. Uh, and he's a very proud Perakian, yeah? uh, very proud son of, of, of Pera. And all the time that I was growing up, I couldn't understand what the pride of that state was uh, because it was simply where my grandparents lived and we had to take a very long drive uh, every Chinese New Year, four to six hours behind lots of lorries. And there was a lot of puking along the way uh, before the highway was built, of course. Uh, but over the years, as I came to know my father's work, uh, the state of Perak opened up and I began to appreciate it uh, for the complex social fabric that it was. Um, he uh, was the first generation of Malaysian scholars uh, to emerge out of the University of Malaya. Uh, he was um, uh, uh, in post-independent Malaya. He was a student of uh, K.G. Tregoning in Singapore at the University of Malaya in Singapore. Uh, he then moved to the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, where he did his masters uh, under the very uh, venerated historian, Professor Wang Gangwu, uh, and where he focused on, again, the state of Pera, and introduced uh, the field of economic history in Malaysian history by writing a classic book called The Western Malay States for his master's thesis, which was one of the first master's theses to be published by Oxford University Press in the Oxford in Asia series. Uh, he then uh, uh, lunged into public life, not often on your own will, yeah? Not often on your own will, you lunged into public life, uh, becoming very formative in forging some of the nation's uh, very important uh, policies and documents, inclu including the Rukun Nagara, he was one of the formulators of the Rukun Nagara, uh, 
one of the formulators of um, our national education system. Uh, and uh, one of, uh, he was the, the man who presented the paper on national history, the concept of national history at our uh, National Cultural Congress in 1971. Uh, he then proceeded to write textbooks for the Malaysian schools. Uh, I was among those who had to study his textbooks. And I must say, in hindsight, they were quite remarkable textbooks, especially when you compare them to the textbooks of today. Uh, they were written in full prose, and they were co contained arguments on Malaysian history, whereas today our history books are written in point form. Yeah. Um, uh, he is um, widely regarded as the historian that uh, wrote the foundational uh, history of uh, post-independence uh, Malaysia. In the course of that, he has got into a lot of quarrels with people. Uh, he also performed the role of public intellectual, uh, writing for newspapers and uh, engaging in polemics on an on a almost daily basis, uh, sometimes in television, uh, quite a, f a prominent television personality. He gave history lectures on radio in RTM in the 1970s. Uh, such was uh, the kind of activity we had in the 1970s uh, and 80s revolving around uh, our, our history. Uh, after that uh, long uh, introduction, uh, two years ago, he completed his own history, uh, which is the autobiography of a historian, aptly titled IKKK. KKK are his initials uh, bequeathed to him by that famous Kongsi in Penang called the Ku Kongsi. Uh, it became one of uh, uh, the top best-selling books um, of that year in 2017. Copies are outside, and he'll be glad to sign them for you. Uh, after that, but he has confessed that it was the most difficult book that he ever had to write. Yeah. And we'll talk a bit about that too. Um, history is uh, in a very interesting place in Malaysian public life these days, uh, especially in the new Malaysia. Uh, I regard history today as uh, an experience of hot rain. Uh, hot rain in the sense that uh, there's a lot of interest and people are arguing over history all the time, but very often in very nonsensical ways. And we seem to be producing Wikipedia historians and internet historians all the time who have very little engagement with serious scholarly work. Uh, we seem to be arguing over points like who founded what and who was the first this and who was the first that without having a broad um, vista of uh, what our uh, historical evolution has been. Uh, very often you are caught in those kinds of arguments, and uh, I don't understand why you perpetuate them, but perhaps we can talk about that also. Um, but uh, we find ourselves in a historical context that is best reflected, I think, in two literary characters, uh, very famed literary characters, uh, who seem to be dominating much of our dialogue in the world today. Uh, those two characters come from a novel called Alice in Wonderland, and those two characters are, go by the name of Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And one of the uh, favorite quotes that they have that I really love and which I think encapsulates our age goes something like this, Tweedledee meets Tweedledum, and Tweedledee, and they are get, having a Socratic dialogue about the nature of truth. And uh, Tweedledee says to Tweedledum, what is, is not. What is not, could be. What could be, is not. So what is not, is. Now that's logic. And Tweedle Dumb bows and says, I agree. And uh, with that uh, introduction, perhaps we can start talking. Yeah? And we can talk a little bit about um, Kuala Lumpur, we're going to talk about uh, your life. Uh, but uh, let me start off uh, in a very relaxed fashion. Oh, I, I must add that uh, the professor is also my father. <laughs> and I'm not only his son, I think I'm also his principal critic. Uh, so this is going to be an interesting uh, uh, bit of repartee. Um, let us start in a very relaxed fashion. Uh, two days ago, I, I went home to the family home, and my mother was teaching 
a young boy of about 16 or 17, who just happened to confess that he hated history. And uh, my mother, being provocative as she always is, decided to drag that poor 16-year-old uh, to make this confession to the Professor Emeritus. Uh, and uh, this poor boy was then upbraided for about 20 minutes about the importance of history. Can you tell us what your sense of history is and why it's important? and why we have the kind of historical sense that we have today in this country. History, to most people, is just an examination subject. And they feel that it's terrible because they are forced to take history when they don't like it. But history is not just a subject. History is reality. Everything has a history. A river has a history. A town has a history. A school has a history. And without knowing the history of anything, you would never understand that. If I ask you about the country's political system, for example, you will not know if you don't know the history, Malaysia's political history. It's very important. But the government is killing history in the schools and in the university. It, is, it does not allow students to take history and in the university too they are discouraged from taking history and so today's young people know so little about not just the country but the people it is not common sense you look at Kuala Lumpur, it has so many different types of communities. It is not common sense. You have to take the trouble to find out about them. There is a difference, for example, between people in Kuala Lumpur and people in Ipoh. Here we simply say Malaysia's population is made up of Malay, Chinese, Indians. It's not so simple. If you are talking about Indians, then there are Tamils, Tamils from India, Tamils from Sri Lanka, and if you're talking about the uh, Chinese, then there are Hakka, Teochew, Cantonese, Hokkien. If you're talking of Malays too, it's not just Malays. The British divided the Malays into two groups. The Malays. Those who originated from the peninsula. But so many of these Malays came from across the sea. There were Bangka Ulu, Rawa, Banja, Boyan. The British called them are the Malaysians. And they later formed different political parties. People in this country don't know that. So it is very important. You go to any advanced country, United States or Britain or Australia, 
They never neglect history. Even Singapore does not neglect history. I think we are the only country in the world that thinks that history is just so many stories. And the children grew up knowing nothing about their own society, which is very, very dangerous. Um, foreboding, uh, way to end that. But can you tell me a uh, little bit about Kuala Lumpur? Let's talk a little bit about Kuala Lumpur. And let's talk about it quite personally. You came from Ipoh. And of course, the distance in those days of a place like Kuala Lumpur and uh, Singapore, uh, huge metropolises, uh, they, they, they were almost like unimaginable cities. Yeah? But I think, if I'm not mistaken, you came to Kuala Lumpur sometime in your teens to play football, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And what was Kuala Lumpur like when you first arrived? Uh, since you, you, you knew of it in your head but had never visited. What was Kuala Lumpur like when you first came here? I was quite fortunate. By the time I was born and started growing up, we were already so familiar with a lot of things. So I could tell the difference between one group of people and another. And to me, and in, it's very interesting because I happen to belong to a school where the pupils were all very anxious to know about other things. Of course, we were very naughty. We used to enjoy going to the amusement park. Nowadays, you don't hear of the amusement park. When I was young, it was very important. And, and what was the most important item in the amusement park, the cabri. <laughs> yes. I already learned how to dance when I was in school. Not that kind of modern dancing, you know, where people jump about the monkeys. <laughs> Ours was very systematic dancing. And I enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed dancing in the cabaret. Imagine I was going to the cabaret when I was in school. And then we visited towns, usually modern towns, right? towns which had cabarets. <laughs> yeah. If you mention Cabaret today, the younger generation doesn't know what it is. And so, because of our curiosity, we learn a lot. History is like that. You have to be curious. You have to want to find out more and more, you cannot be happy remembering just a few items that the teachers mentioned, which is what the pupils of today do. So they go very high marks because they only memorize a few items in the school textbooks of what the teachers mentioned. And when exam, exams come, they could repeat all this. Yeah. 
But in the end, if you ask them of the country, of the people, they don't know. And Malaysia happens to be a very complex country. The society itself, very complex. You cannot say Malaysia's population is made of, of Malay Chinese Indians. No. Much more complicated than that. And if you go investigate thoroughly, you will find that each community is very particular about itself and where it is heading. They also worry about who their children will marry. Of course, it's not as bad now as it was before, but still, you, if you read the newspapers today, they're always quarreling. The Prime Minister is trying to bring the nation together, but he's facing problems. And that's not so surprising. If you ask most Malaysians, you'd be surprised. They're all still very pro one ethnic group or another. They are not thinking as Malaysians yet. They don't even know what that means. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, when you came to KL, uh, and since you were so fond of amusement parks, which amusement park did you go to? <laughs> and what did you find there? In Kuala Lumpur. The amusement park in Kuala Lumpur is no longer here. Yeah, but what, yeah. Which, which one was it? There was only one. Yeah, which one? Well, it was called Kuala Lumpur. The Bukit Bintang amusement park. Bukit Bintang, Bintang yeah. And what did you see there? Oh, so many things. Such as? <laughs> you saw a very famous thing there that you keep telling me uh -huh. about. Why don't you tell everybody what you saw? Uh, I don't know whether you have heard of Rose Chan. <laughs> uh, but more than that, uh, these amusement parks also had Chinese opera. Uh, very popular. And they also had what they call Modern dancing, the most famous being Joke Modern. <laughs> now, when I say Joke Modern today, the young people don't know what I mean. Can anyone here tell me what Joke Modern is? Prof. Anis is at the back there, he knows. <laughs> So our, our generation was interesting in the sense that we never took things for granted. We were always trying to find out more and more. And that helped us a lot. That is what education is all about. Not passing examinations. Now it's all about passing exams. So the young children of today may let us down in the years to come. I want to elaborate a bit about the amusement uh, park culture, <laughs> only because it seems to be a microcosm of the country's history. From stories you have told me, apart from Rose Chan,
And of course, Rose Chan, <coughs> you know, used to have a gimmick in every different amusement park. So I think her, the gimmick you saw was her in a bathtub, right? It was a big bathtub or something where she was swimming in the water. Rose Chan. Yeah? Mm. But um, uh, my father talks a lot about, uh, for example, Chinese opera, but he talks a lot about how he learned Malay. Uh, a lot of it is in, in, in uh, IKKK. Now, my father is, is quite an interesting, uh, he represents quite an interesting generational uh, transition uh, because a lot of people think he, he's a, a Paranakan, a Paranakan uh, by culture, yeah? And a lot of people th uh, think that he speaks Malay very well because he is from a Paranakan background. Um, but that's not actually the case. Uh, because uh, my grandfather, I think, was quite Anglophile, yeah, uh, and was uh, 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 of that generation who identified themselves with Edwardian culture, Edwardian culture, and uh, so my father actually learned his Malay a lot of it uh, from the Bangsawan, hmm? uh, Bangsawan performances in the in the amusement parks, and when we were doing this for his book, uh, and I, as you know, as many of you may know, I'm quite interested in cabaret culture and the songs and the music, and uh, a lot of this interest was developed from conversations I had with my father about uh, meeting, uh, uh, about seeing wrestling matches taking place in amusement parks with Punjabi wrestlers, uh, and the music, musicians, many of the musicians in the cabarets were Filipinos, uh, eventually who became very famous, like the Solianos. So when you look at our cabaret culture, apart from the great cabaret songs uh, of uh, Saloma and uh, uh, so many others, um, you know, one of the very famous Malaysian cabaret songs was a song called Dahil Sayo, Because of You, a uh, very famous uh, love song. Um, and then we had people like Julie Sudero, of course, who sometimes sang in Tagalog and, 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 and uh, uh, things like this. But, um, that was the kind of social microcosm that you found in, in the amusement park. Yeah. But you tell us some very interesting stories, for example, that the amusement park boomed, boomed during the period of the emergency. Yeah. Uh, quite an interesting paradox that you would think a country going through the emergency, uh, communist insurrection, would actually be a country in constant curfew and things. But could you tell us about what actually was happening during Darurat? We were not really frightened because it was so much a part of us. We accepted the fact that the government had to introduce laws to make sure that the, pop, the people don't run wild and fight among themselves. So, even as children, we grew up talking about these things, talking about the need for law and order, but what is not emphasized today is that the British made sports the most important activity. So we were already very active in sports when we were in school. See, the children of today don't, don't play games. Look at Malaysia's performance in international sports. Pathetic. Whereas we used to beat everybody. My school team, for example, St. Michael's Institution, Ipoh, in 1956, we were school children. We beat the top British army side in the country, the Royal Scots Fusilists. And if you look at the old schools, 
you will find that every one of them has at least a feel, at least one feel, some two. And the biggest feel for sports in the whole country, see, if I ask Malaysians today, where is it? They don't know. It is in Tanjung Malim. <laughs> Why Tanjung Malim? Because Tanjung because the British built the teachers training college in Tanjung Malim. And together with the college, the British provided a huge field so that the teacher trainings, the teacher trainers could concentrate on sports. And so we were so fortunate. See, our whole education system was so constructive, so meaningful. Today, they all are encouraged to take exams and score many A's. In the end, what are they? What kind of human beings are they? They keep on fighting among themselves, quarreling about all sorts of funny things. I feel so sad. Education is very important. It is not just about scoring A's in exams. Today, that's the belief. When you went to Singapore, the University of Malaya in Singapore, did you choose to study history? And when you did study history as a student, what did you think you would be studying to become a historian? As a, as a historian, of a transitional period in the country? You see, even I was not a history student. In school, I hardly took history. Wasn't interested in history. I was a science student because the schools all play so much importance on science. To go to the A class, you must score high marks in exams. And you can score high marks in exams mainly in science subjects. So I, 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 my colleagues and I always made sure that we went to the A class. So I was always in the A class. I did not do history. Until Form 5, I did not know do history. But when I had to go to Form 6, I had to decide whether I should do Arts or science? I was already very much into science, but I was also very active in sports. And because of sports, I chose to do arts. And I never regretted But you see, we had to think so seriously. And we did a lot of discussions among ourselves. I must admit that many of our teachers were a disappointment. They could not lead us. So we were able to think for ourselves. 
Uh, I don't think you're telling the truth mm. here. <laughs> because I think you're saying that you thought very hard about going to the arts or science in Form 6. You thought very hard when actually you didn't because you went to the art stream so that you can play football in the afternoon instead of being in the science lab. Isn't that true? Yeah. <laughs> That's not thinking very hard about whether to do the arts or sciences. Uh, I, I... Now, okay, when you went to University of Malaya, uh, again the question, to study history, what did you think you would learn by studying history? Or were you just going there to get a degree? When I went to the university, I did not really know what I should do. See? But by the time I reached the sixth form, I had already neglected science subjects. And I grew eventually fond of history. Because among the art subjects, history was a subject which allowed me to think. If I had done geography, it was not very different from science. So from then onwards, art subjects became very important for me and began to, and I was very fortunate because I had good teachers, not just in the school, but when I went to the university, the history department in the university was beginning to flourish. They had a new professor called Professor K.G. Tregoning who came from Australia. And he really built up that department. And I was so fortunate because of that. Um, how was he significant? You always mention Tregoning as being very significant in the change in the writing of Malaysian history, because there were other historians there. There was John Bastin, there was uh, um, uh, David Bassett, there were all these people. But you focus on your personal supervisor, K.G. Tregoning, as being very significant in the way the writing of Malaysian history changed. Can you tell us a bit about that? In those days, Malaysian history was very much the history of the British in Malaya. People didn't think of the other people. Because the British were the only people who left behind writings on the history of this country. And they wrote among, about themselves. But Trukeji Trugoning was for the one of the first to change that. He said, but this was a period when, not just in Malaysia, but in other places, there was a change from what was called Asia Eurocentric history to Asian centric history. In other words, they wanted us to begin to focus on the history of the Asians themselves. And when you're talking about India, for example, don't just talk about the British. When you're talking about Burma, don't just talk about the British. And that's how we became interested in doing research on the Asian population in this country. And it has helped a lot because 
if not for the fact that we took so much trouble to do research on the Asians in this country, very few people today would know. Of course, the younger people today still don't know, you see. But to me, that's the most important part of Malaysian history. The people of Malaysia. After Singapore, you went back to teach in Telok Hansen, where you're from, of course, and then you came back to the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. So two University of Malayas now set aside, set apart uh, by separation. And uh, you were involved in the setting up of the history department in Kuala Lumpur, who was then under Professor Wang Gangu, who was, then became your supervisor for your master's thesis. Now, this was a very interesting period, of course, in, uh, in the University of Malaya, particularly its history department. History was a core subject uh, for uh, many students who would eventually become principal administrators of the country, planners of the country, politicians. Um, you have had the experience of teaching a rogues gallery of politicians. <laughs> uh, several of them now facing terrible corruption indictments in, in, in the courts. I shall name them, uh, just name some of them. Isa Samad was your student. Zahid Hamidi was your student. Magat Junid was your student. Anwar Ibrahim was your student. Uh, Muhammad Hassan, Menteri Besar of Negeri Sembilan Family, was your student. Some good ones too. Saifuddin Abdullah was your student, today foreign minister. But my question uh, is this. History was so formative at the core of, of learning. Uh, you also, You also began to oversee the opening of the university, for example, to principally Malay students who are coming from uh, rural areas and, and so on. But your generation of scholars had a very serious vocation, quite a radical and revolutionary mission to rewrite Malaysian history. There was you, there was uh, um, uh, Rollins Bonet, who wrote a very significant book on Kedah, uh, um, disputing Light, Francis Light, and that was first written in his book on, on, on Kedah, all under the tutelage of Wang Gangu, uh, and a very interesting department too at that time. People like Anthony Reid were there. Uh, um, uh, I think uh, Anthony Milner came later, right? James Scott was doing research at that time, no? Uh, William Roth was also in the department. Okay, now, um, Emily Satka was at the department. Uh, your first article was a terrible denunciation of J.W.W. Birch, yeah? uh, which again introduced a whole new perspective on how you could write uh, about uh, uh, historical things. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you felt, what that mission was uh, that you and your generation of scholars uh, set out to do in the rewriting of Malaysian history? We wanted a lot of the mistakes in our existing textbooks to be corrected. We were encouraged to study about Malaysians who were supposed to be irresponsible and not able to do things meaningfully. We felt it was unfair to Malaysians. So it was important that we must do research and tell the truth. And we were lucky because from Singapore, when I went over to Kuala Lumpur, 
the lecturers in Kuala Lumpur had also changed their whole outlook. And one of the first who did so much was Professor Wang Gangwu, an old boy of Anderson School, Ipoh. So we all enjoyed ourselves because we were interested in history and we found history so meaningful. The children of today are different. Okay, let's leave the children of today. Just tell us about what you were going through. You, you yourself. At that time. No, I, I, I found that I, look, I could learn so much from Malaysian history. And the, which is why today I have no problems handling malicious problems. But I cannot do it by myself, you see. And that's the sad part. Um, six months ago, uh, the professor was found to have serious blockages. And he's already 83. Uh, so the risk of an open heart triple bypass surgery was very great. Uh, and he was given the option of just carrying on with his heart uh, till it ceased to function anymore. Uh, but he chose to do this rather heavy operation which lasted for nine hours, seven, seven hours. And uh, the reason he gave was when he was asked, why would you take that risk to undergo this procedure? Uh, he said, because I still have a lot of work to do. Um, and part of his work, of course, now is this kind of en en engagement. Um, but uh, we are going to leave young people aside because I have a very important question about that. If you feel the education system has been so bad uh, and our young people are the product of the education system, one of the architects of the education system was you. <laughs> we'll come back, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that later. We'll come back to that later, but I, I will just, I, I just want to, want to ask. Uh, in your history of writings, and uh, um, next year we will be publishing uh, professors' selected writings. Uh, Oxford University Press will publish that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I have been uh, uh, compiling all of this work um, with Prof uh, for the past uh, five or six years. And it really is a, a really monumental uh, uh, task and there are a great many realizations that come from this process. Uh, he has been teaching at the University of Malaya for 53 years. And he has not had a single student to help him with this. Uh, and that this task and responsibility then falls on the family uh, to do. is a very interesting um, take on what our universities actually produce. Uh, secondly, in the course of compiling all of these writings, I have found a, a, a vast array and great number of wonderful publications, uh, the Journal of the Malaysian Branch of the Royal Asiatic Society that produced some of the most formative articles on Malaysian history when the professor was its principal editor, working at that time with a man called Mubin Shepherd. Mubin Shepherd was this strange English, English man who would call very early in the morning. It's uh, Irishman. Well, Irishman, English lad. No. <laughs> he worked for the British, so whatever Irishness he had in him was given away. And he was from Northern Ireland, he was from Belfast, yeah, so, you know, it, um, um, uh, he was an Irishman who forsook his uh, uh, Irishness to work for British administration, yeah? He was resident of Trangano, and he'd phone very early in the morning, 5.30, 6 o'clock, to, to speak about, you know, the next issue of the, the Journal of the... Malaysian branch of Royal Asia Society. There was a journal within the University of Malaya, uh, a historical journal. There was the Journal of the Historical Society of Malaysia, which today has a big office and does nothing. Uh, there was the Purpustaka National Library Journal. There was the Federation of Museums Journal. All fantastic, and you get people like Carol Lederman and a whole host of uh, 
Raymond Firth and, and scholars constantly contributing to these. Uh, 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 and then my father was very, Im very influential in forging the first Malay language publications, things like Jabat and, 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 and uh, he was also the first professor to deliver his professorial address in the Malay language. Uh, and I'll come back to ask you why you chose to, to, to do that. But in compiling all of these uh, writings, I, I find that there are no longer any of these publications. Uh, they don't exist anymore. They've, they've all gone defunct and you, were, you, 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 you trained scholars in that process uh, through these journals, encouraging uh, young emerging scholars to write and so on. And today there's so little of, of, of that kind of activity. But I wanted to ask you in your own work, and this is where you wrote a very important uh, monograph on Kuala Lumpur called Kuala Lumpur, The Early Years, which is now no longer in publication, but we are going to republish it. But one of the very interesting things in your work is that you began to move from writing about political history. Hmm? Uh, you, you wrote some very significant articles on the murder of Birch, later on the Panko Treaty, on things like uh, the royalty, uh, specific royal states. Why did you start moving into writing about social history? And you were one of the first and very few people who have consistently written about towns uh, like Taiping, Telo Anson, uh, and Kuala Lumpur. Uh, why was that important for you to make that shift from political history to social history? The trouble with history in the past was that people thought that history was all about politics. But history should be about everything. And if you don't know the history of the society, then you don't know the society, you see. You look at our people today, they're still quarreling. Because they don't know their own society. And that's very sad. You cannot build a nation with people thinking differently, especially if they are made up of different ethnic groups. And our society is so com complicated. It's made up of so many ethnic groups. If I ask young Malaysians today about these people, they cannot explain. You cannot simply say, oh, he's an Indian. He, he could be more than, he could be a um, Tamil from India or Tamil from Sri Lanka. He could be Malayali, he could be Telugu, he could be Punjabi, he could be a Bengali. You can't just call him Indian. And each group has its own cultural ways. So in order to understand Malaysia, you need to understand its people. Uh, one of the interesting ways you moved into this writing of social history, uh, and uh, my father is a scholar who will very openly tell you that he hates reading books. <laughs> and uh, 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 he enjoys listening to gossip and listening to, to, to family stories, for example, uh, and anecdotal uh, stuff. But you also then began to devote a lot of your research to documents, letters, uh, treaties, very what you call primary source material. And you actually were never a book reader. Uh, and whenever you were asked to read, uh, review a book, you were quite impatient with it. And the poor book often got a bad review as a result of your impatience rather than actual. But can you tell me this obsession you had with primary sources? 
what do primary sources give you? If you if you read the auto, uh, the the, mem uh, the the monograph on Kuala Lumpur early years, again you will find that there is very little uh, book reference, and that there is a lot of reference, for example, uh, to particular treaties, yeah, uh, to to letters that were written, uh, to uh, uh, administrative uh, notices and things like that, all of which and newspapers you have always considered to be one of your major primary sources. Can you tell us why uh, this material is so important to you? History should be about the truth. It's in, it is not something that you can cook up. Unfortunately, we find that in this country, people just write as they please. And unless you have proper documents and proof, for example, we have since defined history as being based on empirical evidence. History must be based on empirical evidence. Evidence which can be checked and confirmed. Not just any paper that you bring up. Newspapers very often are inaccurate, but very often they are also useful. People in Kuala Lumpur, for example, do not know if they have to write on the his history of Kuala Lumpur what is the most important primary source that they can use. They don't know. The Malay Mail. The Malay Mail began publication in 1896, and it has not stopped until today. Even during the Japanese occupation, the Malay Mail came out in Japanese. It was called Malay Shinbun. So it is like Kuala Lumpur's diary. A lot of information that you need to know about Kuala Lumpur, you will find in the email. If you read books, that we call secondary sources, there is no guarantee that the, the books are accurate. Unless, of course, you have you are able to go over the book critically, and then you can assess how accurate it is. I've got uh, we're, uh, three small things we will run through, and then maybe we may take one or two questions, uh, and then call it a, 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 an, an evening, quite an amusing evening, I hope. Uh, but I have three quick questions. Uh, one is, uh, a controversy that you have been very engaged with and involved with, much to my irritation, mm -hmm. over the past 10 years, which is this nonsense controversies about who founded Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. And I can never understand why Malaysians are so obsessed with who founded this and who was the first person to do that and who, uh, um, uh, who, who, who put... Uh, I suppose the person who founded Kuala Lumpur would be the person who put his knapsack on the, on the convergence of the river and decided, I'm going to live here. That's probably the first person who founded Kuala Lumpur. But why are we constantly dragged into these kinds of contentions all the time? Why are our people always wanting to be the first this and that in, in modern Malaysia? Because somehow they believe that if you are the first, then you have more right than others. They believe that, you see. Um, uh, and how do we stop that kind of habit? Education. <laughs> you have to educate the young. 
So long as the young is not properly educated, they will always make mistakes. Um, I'm going to defend the young, <laughs> and I'm going to say the young have been kind of cheated. Mm. They have been thrown into an education system that has failed, uh, and then many people blame people like yourself for failing that education system. What do you have to say for yourself <laughs> to young people? It's very simple. I was not given a chance to help prepare the proper history syllabus. You take, for example, in the University of Malaya, the history department used to be the biggest department in the university. And history was a very popular subject. And then suddenly, a directive came from the top. The arts faculty, which used to take 1,300 students every year, was told that it could not take 1,300 students. It must reduce, the number must be reduced to 300. The arts faculty with 13 departments. So now the history department is among the smallest in the University of Malaya. And it's so sad, you see. And there's nothing we can do about it because we are not the ones who are who are making decisions on the university. Just a few facts. For example, the University of Malaya is the only university that still has a history department to itself. So the rest are all, you know, history as a subject taught within kind of regional studies and whatever not. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I, all I ever wanted to do was to go to the University of Malaya. Uh, my father would take me to the football field where he'd play and I'd run around there and the whole campus just seemed so wonderful and inspiring. And I always remember the fun fairs that we used to be taken to during uh, graduation. Uh, and all my cousins would come from, you know, all over the place and stay in Pantai uh, and we'd go and, and have fun in the fun fair uh, in the 1970s. The campus was just so inspiring. I never thought of wanting to grow abroad uh, uh, until the 1980s when my father decided that I should go abroad, much to my uh, dismay. But I used to love that department and uh, um, uh, I used to go there all the time and it was a bustling department. It was really full of people and it was full of activity. And my father used to give lectures in the biggest lecture hall uh, in the University of Malaya, which could take about 1,000 students at least. Uh, and I've been informed that the latest intake into the history department is 18. 18, yeah? 18. And of course, uh, one, I'm also quite amused very often because whenever there's a controversy about history uh, in this country, some nonsensical thing is being discussed yet again. Uh, Professor Ku Ke Kim is to be blamed. Mm. Yet his textbook, which I consider actually a very fine textbook, although he's my father, but um, was, has no longer been the textbook used in schools since the late 80s. Yeah? And uh, he has actually not been on the textbook board, which you used to be uh, on uh, since about that time, the 80s. Uh, but he seems to be the most identifiable face uh, for you to blame all our his historical uh, problems uh, with. Okay. But let me end, and then maybe one or two people may want to ask you something. Um, we end uh, with your own life. 
Why was this the most difficult book you had to write? Your own history. I'm used to writing about other people, <laughs> not about myself. So it was very difficult writing the book. <laughs> also, when you are writing about yourself, how much of the truth can you reveal? <laughs> okay, we will end our conversation. Maybe just one or two questions, Rahel Ken. Just one or two. Anybody have a question or a comment or something you wanted to say to the professor for close to 20 years that you waited now? Yes. Do you think the anglicisation of Malaysia was a good thing in hindsight? Because you mentioned that they created schools and training programmes and everything else. But then I'm a visitor here, so what my experience in Malaysia is that um, colonial history is, is viewed on as like with mixed reactions and not very positively. But you seem to sort of glorify it. So could you expand on that, please? Yeah, thanks. Uh, very good question, actually. One I wanted to ask you. Your view of the British in Malaya has changed over the years. You started off very critical of British indirect rule. Indirect, yeah, we were never a colony. Uh, it was, uh, the, the British started a system, very interesting system of colonialism called uh, uh, indirect rule. You rule through proxies, basically, yeah. Uh, your view of the British has changed uh, over the years. You started out being very critical but you seem to be quite partial to what the British did in more recent years. And uh, the question was, do you consider British administration in this country as a positive thing or a negative thing? Right? On the whole, I think they have contributed a great deal to the country. Very few people know, few people know this because they don't take the trouble to investigate. But as, a, as just one example, sports. <laughs> you look at the state of sports in this country today. Pathetic, <laughs> pathetic. And yet, when the emergency was declared in 1948, in January 1949, Malaya became world champion in badminton. And we won again in 52 and 55. Now we have to import coaches from China. We, Instead of teaching the Chinese how to play badminton, now we are getting the Chinese to teach us. And I look at the way they play badminton today, it's terrible. <laughs> See, they, they don't know the history of sports. Eh? You'd be surprised. Even sports has a history. Eh? Of course, I don't blame our people. Even if you watch football in London, or in Europe, it's quite pathetic. The, 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 the people of today have no idea how the game was played before. Uh, you forgot to mention that one of the people who did win the World Championship in badminton was your classmate. Hmm? One of the people who did win the World Championship in 1955 mm -hmm. was your classmate, Ang Bun Bi. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one of my classmates became a double international. He represented the country in badminton and football. See how different the school children of those days were. <laughs> Yes, one more. 
then I think you have another event, so we will, we will wind it up. Hello. After that. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Nazrin. And my question is, Nazrin, uh, my, my question um, to the professor is basically, um, you know, nowadays, okay, um, I understand your um, complaints about young people. Um, just about two days ago, for example, I was at the airport and somebody who was 90 plus maybe said, young people nowadays don't know each other anymore. Uh, you go to school, you go to work, you don't even know people in your community, right? So like, uh, now you're saying as well that we young people, we don't know history. Okay, yeah, sure. I understand this point of view, but also we have a, a system that doesn't encourage um, critical learning. Okay, sure. But then um, with our way of life right now, we are more detached from culture. Um, when you were younger, you had the opportunity to go to watch Chinese operas and bang someone plays casually. Um, nowadays, it's something that you might see in Publica or Isana Budaya. You, you cannot just go to a fun fair. So what's your advice on like, how can we encourage, you know, what do you think needs to be done to enable, not just encourage, but enable more people to learn about history, you know, because otherwise it's just going to be something that someone who has a lot of free time can do, academicians or someone who doesn't need to work every day um, until they're tired, right? So how can we basically enable, you know, on a wider scale, uh, people to be able to learn about history? Because I think we have, the system does not encourage us to learn about history. So how can you think, how do you think that can be changed? Okay, I'll just truncate your question. Sorry, yeah, it was a bit long. And all the things you see, cultural things you see in, Pusaka, uh, in uh, Publica are done by Pusaka. So, so <laughs> you know. Uh, now, uh, the question is, the system doesn't encourage engagement with history and culture uh, and society. Uh, what, need, what can people do uh, on their own and as a society to begin that kind of engagement? Outside of the education system and outside of uh, universities, what can people do to engage with history and culture on their own? I think they cannot. These things need to be understood. And unless you have grown up Understanding these things, people cannot expect you to make any kind of significant contribution. And that is the problem today. The younger generation is becoming more and more ignorant of the country, so they are not contributing to the construction of the country and everything is it's very hard to explain to people who are young because if you have lived 80 over years then you can compare see, what what it was like then 80 years ago and what it is like today but if you tell the young people they have no idea. And it is very difficult to convince them that what you are telling them is the truth. Okay. Uh, we are not going to end there. I'm going to add on a little bit uh, in a more encouraging way, and then we'll conclude. <laughs> this, I think, is the big generational gap. You want to say something? Yeah, um, I think, yes. Um, but again, there are those of us who want to listen. You know, I don't have anywhere I can go just on the weekend to hear old people speak. I like listening to old people speak because from history, like you said, when you have experience, you can compare. I don't have that much experience, but I want to listen. That's why I came here today. So yeah, the more encouraging note, please. Yeah. Um, this, is, this, I think, is a major generational challenge uh, that we have. Uh, I think there is an element, and we can be, we are among families, so we can be quite candid and open. I think there's a particular kind of frustration of the generation of my fathers, uh, very often who have been very involved in things like nation building, only to see themselves been kind of played out by that very system. My interesting take of that, and I'm the intermediary generation. I was born in 1969, 69 generation is very interesting actually, because we were on the cusp of everything. 
We were on the cusp of a change in the education system, cusp, cusp on the change of, of major political systems. It was my generation that, and the clashes of my generation that brought about the NEP and all of these things. I was in, even in a Catholic school that was seeing the transition to becoming a national school, um, whereby we had a national syllabus in Malay, but we saw the white ghosts, the brothers, huh? white ghosts floating everywhere uh, at the same time. Uh, so it was a very interesting transitional thing and my father and I have this conversation all the time which sometimes falls into an argument but uh, increasingly rarely. rarely. Uh, but I think uh, that generation of, uh, of, of very venerated uh, uh, um, uh, educators and, um, do, do suffer from a crisis of institutionalization. I think they trust institutions. Uh, my generation is a more reckless generation, I think, <laughs> that we began to realize that the institutions were failing us. Uh, your generation is a generation that I think is too inundated with things. Right? Uh, the answer is very simple. I think there's a lot of engagement that can be done uh, autonomously. Uh, 30 years ago, I started work with Klantan ritual traditions that then became uh, you know, a foray into, into looking at culture uh, as a form of informing history and immediately engaging with communities and immediately engaging with this kind of history. Many young people today have the facility of technology uh, which they can use. They just got to decide how they are going to use it and for what. <laughs> okay? that's, that's the big thing. Uh, and I think it can be a very useful thing for history, for the dissemination of history, for the engagement. Um, and my father, as I said, is only telling half the truth, to be honest, because, and I say this why, he has no legacy in terms of his students. But his translator, for example, from his English material into Malay, uh, is, a, is a really intelligent, dynamic, wonderful young man uh, who comes from a low, lower middle class background, from a small town like Kanga, uh, who has been working with my father for six, seven years, and he's not even a historian. Yeah, he he, wor he worked in the in the sciences, uh, and he's today the member of parliament for Kanga. His name is Amin Ahmad, hmm? uh, and my father has engagements with young people uh, all the time. So he's. His young people gripes are actually a bit, you know, I don't take it so seriously because he's actually engaging with young people all the time. Uh, he's very open and uh, you can always come and visit. In fact, it'll be good to boost his semangat uh, uh, with this. Uh, but I don't think it's such a lost cause, actually. Uh, I think for a person who helped build the university, to see that university fall flat in his face is very difficult. It's very difficult. And I suppose there's a lot of that hangover. But on an independent engagement, I think he is very spirited and he is very giving and very sharing. Uh, so those doors are always open. Uh, I think uh, the, the key now is no longer institutional engagement. It is very intimate engagement. Uh, and that is uh, the way to go. Uh, I thank you all for coming. I think this is very important also because, uh, as I said, my father has uh, not been well. And uh, he, he's waiting for his heart to kick in, you know, <laughs> kick in. So it's kind of there, but uh, uh, I put a Facebook post up and I said, my father is like an old storyteller, like the great Dalangs that I work with. And the great Dalangs, you know, they don't feed off themselves. They feed off other people. So it is your spirit that I hope today will get him home. And his heart already quite kicked today. It's, it's got you know, a lot of anecdotes and uh, a bit of humor and everything. Uh, so like old st storytellers, we feed off the spirits of others. So I'm extremely grateful and appreciative that you all took the time to come. Professor Kukekim, thank you.